Right, great. So uh, my name is Kayla Sadaway and I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently an intern and a vicar at Grace Lutheran in Broomall, which is in Delaware County. And uh, before the rest of the folks introduce themselves, um, I thought we could have um, a brief devotion, just a short scripture reading and a prayer, and um, just kind of walk you through how this will work. So, but before we do anything, it's always good to start with scripture. So here are the words of Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. I try to count them, they are more than the sand. I come to the end, I am still with. Uh, let us pray. This is a, it is called the Rainbow Christ Prayer. Rainbow Christ, you light up the world. You make rainbows as a promise to support all life on earth. In the rainbow space, we can see all the hidden connections between sexualities, genders, and races. Like the rainbow, may we embody all the colors of the world. Amen. So, uh, tonight... I, you won't hear a lot from me, fortunately. I am just here to ask some questions and guide the conversation. <clears throat> I have some questions to help do that. If you have any specific questions, please feel free to put them in the chat for everyone or feel free to send them to me uh, privately, whatever is your comfort. Um, also, just be aware, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can, um, otherwise, I will try and combine them and, and see if we get repeats just to help streamline the process. All right. So um, I will now ask folks who are here to speak um, to introduce themselves in no particular order. So perhaps we could do it by invitation. Um, and I will invite, um, I would be remiss in not recognizing Pastor Marie Sager from St. Timothy's and Aston for putting so much of this together and dreaming this up with me and seeing it into fruition. So um, I could sing her praises all night, but I will ask Pastor Marie to introduce herself first. Thanks, Kayla, Vicar Kayla. Um, as you said, I am the pastor at St. Timothy's Lutheran in Aston. This is my second call. And my first call was in Hayes, Kansas. And so um, this is my first time living on the East Coast. And so it's just kind of been a, a new thing for me. So I'm really excited to kind of be here and to be here with all of you. I would like to invite Pastor Brian Penman. Um, sure. My name is uh, Pastor Brian. Um, I serve at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Conshohocken, where I've been the last eight years. Um, uh, that's my full-time gig, but around the Synod, I also serve as the chair of the Congregational Vitality Team, and I also serve as the Dean of Lower Montgomery Conference um, and serve occasionally on different worship things and um, have spoken kind of widely really around... Our the youth ministry things. Um, so I guess that's kind of the that I kind of bring to the panel about helping um, uh, congregations and um, think through issues related to LGBTQIA plus inclusion around youth ministry things. So way back in the day when we used to run wonderfully made 
camp as a synod, I helped kind of shepherd that into fruition for a couple of years when uh, Molly Dean was still with us. But um, haven't had the opportunity to do that camp in many years, but you never know. Some things come back around and back into life, so who knows. But um, I honestly don't know who all is on the panel, so um, I'm going to guess that Noah is on the panel, and I'll call on him to go next. Uh, good guess. Uh, I am. I'm Pastor Noah Hepler. I'm at uh, the Lutheran Church of the Atonement in the fabulous Fishtown neighborhood of Philadelphia. Um, people often ask me how long I've been there. I don't know. It's uh, I started out here in an un unofficial capacity, uh, which then became official. So I've been in Philadelphia a little over 10 years, and uh, I, I fell in love with the city um, once I got here very quickly. And uh, we may have another introduction coming up, but I may as well do it. Uh, and we have Thor with us. So <laughs> he may show up on occasion. So I thought I would go ahead and introduce him. Uh, and so I will pass it to uh, Pastor Jen. Hi, I am Jen Casey, pastor at Holy Trinity Lutheran in Wallingford and also Dean of the Delaware Conference and I have been at Holy Trinity just over five years and this is my third call. I served a congregation on Long Island and also at uh, Lunar Run University and Southern Seminary in Columbia, South Carolina. So yeah, glad to be here. Go screaming doves. <laughs> and I will uh, ask uh, Joey to introduce himself. Hello, my name is Joey Klinger. I am pastor at Redemption Lutheran Church, which is located in Northeast Philadelphia. I also serve on the Synod Council and head of the nominating committee, so I'll be coming for you again next year to help serve on anything in the Synod, so be looking for me. Um, and I'm just glad to be here. I don't, is there anyone else on the panel that I should hand it off to? I don't think so, but I don't know for sure. No, I think that's all. Thank you. Um, so I will start, um, I've already received some questions and it is the question of the hour. Um, why is it so important to welcome LGBTQIA plus people? And also why do they need to be treated differently and not just like the rest of our community? I will let you, um, let you each jump in as you feel moved. Well, I think I can jump. I, there, there's a direct story I have about being called here to Redemption. I've been at Redemption now three and a half years, but Redemption is my first call right out of seminary. And when I got here to interview, um, I had no idea where they stood on any LGBT issues. It was not on their website. It was not anywhere in anything. Um, and so in the interview I asked, is this going to be a problem? Do we know what the, how the congregation feels about any sort of diversity when it comes to gender or sexuality and the response was we have no idea we think it'll be okay so they had to base i mean when you're in the call process you take what you can get and it seemed like a good call at the time so i stuck through it but going through that process having to be vulnerable and open not knowing what the outcome would be having to get all the way to a call vote hoping that these people would be fine with it, but also it could all come crashing down at a moment in a soul crushing kind of thing was very difficult. And it all could have been solved if they would have taken one moment to either put on their website or to go through the RIC process to say, we're fine with this, we welcome this, we're okay with this. Without that welcome, it's very hard for me to believe that a place is welcoming um, until I can say, ask and have something to point to that that's needed um, without it we can't make that assumption. We can't afford to make that assumption because I've made that assumption before and been burned before. So luckily this time it did work out for me and I needed a job. So I was going to stay in that call process, but it would have been so much smoother and easier with just a simple line or two saying, yes, we affirm this or yes, we're open to this. Uh, <clears throat> I think I might add that uh, I, I think what Pastor Joey's touched on is a lot of what first came to my mind is, is not that the LGBTQ plus community wants to be treated differently, 
we want to be treated the same. Uh, that that's the goal. the The difference that happens uh, is because of how we have encountered the church. That we cannot assume uh, that a church is going to be welcoming, um, unlike somebody who's uh, cisgendered and straight. Uh, that that they don't have to ask that question. They they might ask that question in different ways. Um, but, but I think all of that points to that what we're striving for is a, a recognition of, of the, the basic personhood and humanity of, of all people. Or, uh, as the Bible puts it, a recognition of the divine image and, and the other person. And I think to um, echo Pastor Joey, um, there's been a lot of uh, places that simply say all are welcome. And it simply doesn't mean all. Um, so then, so people um, wonder, you know, why can't we just have all are welcome? Um, because all are welcome has never been uh, meaning all um, that I'm aware of, anyway. Yeah, I think um, one of those things that I think going off of what Pastor Jen said of sometimes when I see all are welcome, sometimes I'll think it will have like an invisible asterisk there of, well, maybe not me. Um, I am someone who came out later in life. Um, I have been out as someone who is bi um, for three years. And so, but I've been kind of a, a very big part of an ally kind of before I kind of came out as bi, um, but just kind of looking at and talking with other people who are part of the LGBT community, one of the reasons why it's important to specifically say that you're welcome, that LGBT people are welcome, is that a lot of, there is some specific hurts that have been done against those within the LGBT community. Um, yeah. I'll also take a stab at it mainly because um, I spent a good part of my life um, south of these parts um, and in predominantly evangelical circles. And all to them means hate the sin, love the sinner which can often be bait and trap into to hateful situations where um, discrimination begins to, to infect. And uh, there is a long history of the Christian church participating in reparative therapy programs that are psychologically damaging to LGBT individuals. Um, and so that's where you almost become this like sleuth detector of like, okay, but what does your theology really mean? Um, and so it is helpful um, to have the conversations as a congregation about where you as a community are in the spectrum of welcome. Because much as people come out of the closet, as families um, come to know uh, a member of their family that have come out, they go through different phases. And so to, to at least do a temperature check of where your congregation is. Um, I remember doing my, my clinical pastoral training at the hospital during seminary and my supervisor, who's supposed to be welcoming and like, you know, very well adjusted and, and thinking through all these things um, was at the functional level of, I don't, it doesn't bother me. I just don't want to see it, which is still not, fully inclusive of, of normalcy of uh, lesbian and gay people. Um, so like even people who have spent a lot of time working on this stuff sometimes land themselves on different parts of the spectrums of acceptance. Um, and so that's why I think it's really important for congregations to do that deep and sometimes difficult work of having the conversations around difficult topics. Um, but it is important for the safety of those we have yet to be in ministry with, AKA new people, AKA the people you wanna grow your church with, 
that we have those conversations and get our own house in order before we start saying that all are truly welcome. So um, I just want to also say thank you to all of you who are taking the time on this very hot evening to be part of these conversations. So thank you. This gives hope for the church. So um, before I move on to a, a different question, there was kind of like a follow up to this question about, you know, why do we have to be specific about LGBTQ people? And someone kind of followed up with, well, you know, do we have to be um, explicit about being friendly towards different ethnicities? Um, so if someone wants to speak to that. I, um... I would say that anytime there's a group of people who, um, you know, if there's a particular ethnicity that is saying that they don't feel welcome or they are uncertain if they are welcome, then we should be explicitly saying they are welcome if we mean they are welcome. Um, if there's no group feeling that they're not welcome in every single context, then we wouldn't need welcoming statements because all would indeed feel welcome. Um, but I think anytime someone is crying out saying, I don't feel welcome here, then we need to do the hard work of assessing, are they welcome here? And then being very clear in whatever capacity we need to, um, to express that hospitality. So that list may get very long. Um, and so when we were doing our welcoming statement at Holy Trinity and talking, you know, working through the reconciling in Christ process, you know, a question came up, you know, well, how long is this going to get? As long as it needs to be. Um, I don't think there's a, you know, until all experience the hospitality and until we all actually become welcoming of every possible person who feels um, othered. Um, yeah, that's a great point, Pastor Jen. Hospitality and welcome are in the eyes of the visitor or the outsider and not the community itself, whether that's LGBTQ or race or ethnicity or um, income, whatever. So, yeah, thanks. Pastor Marie, were you, I'm sorry, were you going to jump in or? Well, I was just a, basically what Pastor Jen had said of, that I know, um, and maybe some of the other people on the panel who have gone through the RIC process um, and have a welcome statement can also talk. But um, one of those things is like what Pastor Jen said, it's kind of, it can be many different things. And I know um, I've read different welcome statements that talk about um, being specifically welcome to the LGBTQ plus community or um, the BIPOC, which stands for Black Indigenous People of Color, specifically naming that or naming people of different abilities or um, politicalness. Um, and so it can be kind of really when we say all are welcome, who do we mean? What, what, what do we mean? So. Um, so I noticed we're kind of using these letters RIC, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, does someone want to explain RIC? Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. That's uh, reconciling in Christ, uh, which is a designation that's given after a congregation goes through a process with reconciling works. Um, which is the the I hate to say new name, but the but the, some of you may know reconciling works by an older name of Lutherans Concern North America, uh, but they have changed uh, after the decisions in 09 to allow congregations to uh, and other expressions of the church to call openly gay people uh, into positions. Uh, they changed their name because that project for them. Uh, was complete. Now it was, uh, it's to focus on this reconciling thing. So again, it's a, uh, a designation that's given after a congregation has completed the process. And the pinnacle of that process is the, the welcome statement, which is then reviewed. Uh, and then if it's, a, if it's acceptable, then they grant that, which means you go on a, uh, a database uh, for 
uh, LGBTQ plus people uh, who are looking for a Lutheran church uh, and they want to know whether or not it is a welcoming and affirming place, uh, then, then that, that designation, uh, if they know what RIC means, uh, lets them know immediately that, uh, that that should be a safe place. Thanks, Pastor Noah. And I know one thing, um, so that is governed by Reconciling Works, the organization, and, and that's on a list of resources that we were going to ask. Um, but we will save that for the end and kind of hit you with all those books and, and resources all at once. So um, we had a, another question a little bit ago, um, and it was about what kind of, uh, just a second, oh, what kind of events can churches have that don't just make someone feel welcome, but to actually help them find a home in the church? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one too. So I got to atonement and atonement assumed that because the SEPA Synod was uh, RIC that that automatically meant that they as a congregation of the SEPA Synod was RIC. So they never completed uh, the process. And so we worked on completing that. And then when we got done and we got our uh, uh, announcement that we were uh, now designated as an RIC congregation, I asked the, the, the committee and the congregation that had worked on it to what, what would they like to do to put into action these words? Because uh, sometimes it's easy to get the statement and to publish the statement and feel like you're done. And so without missing a beat, uh, one of the older women in the congregation said, I think we should have a drag bingo. And I said, uh, Zoa, have you ever been to a drag bingo? And she said, no. And I said, I, I haven't either, but there, you know, I don't, I don't know how this message will mesh with being church. Uh, but it started a process in which we did eventually put together a, uh, a drag bingo. I don't think we were the first church to ever do that. I hope not. Um, but that was what we did to try to really emphasized that this was um, a community that was going to honestly engage in the process of reconciling the divide uh, that the church had created uh, between itself and, and the queer community. Piggybacking on that, I think there is a balance. It's very important to have events like that, yes, that but it's also, I think, important just to include LGBTQI people in your normal church life. Doing, ask them to be parts of things. Ask, invite them to show up to something. The way I stayed involved and got involved with this church is the youth pastor kept asking me to go to things, and I came. <laughs> Doing, he put me on committees. He made me do things in the church, and that got me inspired to be in the church. And I'm not saying a drag bingo wouldn't have helped immensely to make me feel welcomed. It would have, but also just having that normalcy of being involved in what everyone else is doing is also vital to that welcome, Dean, of not being othered and saying, we want you on this committee because you're LGBTQIA, which could be a good thing and you do want that, but also saying, we appreciate your other skills as well. You have all of these gifts to bring to the table. Um, it, it's about hitting that balance. That can be hard to do. But trying to get both those things, Jane, it's not always just pride parades and rainbows. It can also just be the pastor showing up for dinner with the family or doing something like that, doing that also makes that welcome really cement itself. Uh, so this is kind of a combined question. Um, is RIC um, just Lutheran? And I'll... I'll, I'll ask it that way as, as opening up. Is RIC just Lutheran? And then with that, the RIC status, why would my church want to, like, if, if we hang a rainbow flag, we might lose some people that are already there. And um, it feels really political to take that kind of stance. So first, is RIC mm -hmm. just Lutheran? And then if we do that, do we have to hang a rainbow flag and what happens with uh, with that. T 
to my knowledge, RIC status is for, for Lutheran organizations and congregations. I do not know. I mean, there may be some ecumenical Lutheran affiliated organizations that also earn RIC. Um, also in full disclosure, I think it's a ridiculous name um, because it doesn't mean anything to anyone outside of the Lutheran church. So if you're trying to reach someone in the LGBT community and you tell them we're a reconciling in Christ congregation, that means nothing to them um, unless they've done their homework and researched what that means within ELCA Lutheran congregations. So um, I honestly think it does more to just put a rainbow flag on your sign than it does um, going through the process of RIC. What RIC, the process of becoming an RIC congregation though does do for the congregation is it has a wealth of resources to help guide the conversation at a congregational level so that there are safe places to hold those difficult disagreements and, and allow space for the spirit to move in the community to come to a collective consensus about things um, and be able to implement a, a welcome statement in your community. So um, they have been working on those resources for years and they're all on their website and they're fantastic. And they often have different tracks of how quickly you wanna move through those things. So, um, but yeah, other denominations have things like, um, is it more light Presbyterian churches? See, mainline Protestants are really good at kind of funky names to describe things. Um, and our Methodist siblings are really wrestling with what it means to be affirming in the Methodist church right now. Um, I regularly pray for my Methodist uh, friends who are pastors because it's, it, I am watching them have that conversation that we had in 2009 and, it, and it's divisive and it's, it's it's heated and it's difficult. So I know that treading into those areas are not easy conversations for folks. Is it the Episcopal Church that is open and affirming? Yes, yes, the Episcopal Church is. Yeah, that's what their version of RIC is. Is called oh mm -hmm. boy, open and affirming. <laughs> One of my close friends is a recently retired Methodist pastor, um, and there is a despite the the schism that this makes in the Methodist church, there is a, a Methodist version of RIC. I don't remember what it's called, but. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. The, um, I get posted on Facebook all the time and I'm not, it's not coming to my mind, but yes, there are, there are organizations out there within the United Methodist church that are naming places. The, uh, since we're talking about RIC, uh, my name's Bill Schaefer. I'm a retired ELCA pastor. Marie Schaefer's here beside me. Uh, I'm a, uh, on the learning curve in this arena a good bit, but a lot further now than I was three years ago. Uh, we're very happy to be members at Holy Trinity in Wallingford and blessed to have Jen Casey as our pastor. And over there somewhere on your screen is Joseph Troyan. Joey, Jody headed the team in which Marie and I served uh, to shepherd the process for Holy Trinity to become an RIC congregation. And the final vote was taken in January. So I learned a lot in the course of that, obviously. The congregation which we moved in Delaware, uh, Montgomery County, Grace Wimber had just become RIC uh, just before we left there. We weren't around there much because I was still an active pastor in interim ministries, but they had, had that. And um, our first turn in the water, relationships within that community were from that congregation. Uh, a very good friend, um, uh, lesbian, and her fiance asked us to drive them to the train to elope to Boston when they want to get married, for example. So, so we've had those personal ties, but I've never had the kind of active engagement with the vocabulary and the issues that are shuffling here until we got involved with the RIC process at Holy Trinity. Um, and this doesn't really answer the main question as, as it was asked, but one of the most striking things I remember seeing in that process, uh, I wonder how many of you have seen the the short video from St. John's Lutheran Church, uh, is it North Carolina, Jody, do you remember? Um, fascinating thing, but the, the, the big learning there was the pastor there answering the question people ask, well, we are welcoming. Why do we have to put this out there? We are welcoming. And the point made that folks on the outside don't know that. The point is who's gonna, if people are going to even try coming to find out if you're welcoming, what clues might they get? And that's what I think Joey was getting at. Hopefully the, the problem of the name is not is a problem because what does that mean to someone? But hopefully with a little sign of the rainbow and whatever and, and reading up, that becomes the sign before they get there to say, you might at least take a chance on us. 
I, I'm holding my breath now because we just officially did this, but this was all during the, the pandemic time. And we just went back to in-person worship, what, three weeks ago, something like that. So we don't have the face-to-face -face kind of encounters where you might even begin to have the activities that one would hope would be expressions of this. Um, so I'm, I'm waiting to see, uh, but I'm, I'm excited for it to be here at hand at uh, Holy Trinity in Wallingford. Uh, yeah, so I just want to bring it back and um, kind of follow up. I, I know we kind of ironed out the RIC question that there are other organizations. Uh, so RIC is just for uh, Lutherans and then each other denomination kind of has their own funky label on, on their open and affirming uh, ministries. Um, and I kind of want to come back to that word, affirmation, but I also want to uh, kind of cl close the loop on why would we become RIC because of the, the fear of losing people or also, um, you know, the, the two, the two, it's too political for us. We can't do that. So to jump at the second half of that question first, it's too political. Um, the church can comment on political issues that doesn't make the church political. I mean, we have things to say about LGBT issues. We have things to say as a church about healthcare. We have things to say about what's happening at our border. That's the church speaking the gospel. And if that's misconstrued as political, so be it. But it's not political, it's the gospel. Um, and you are taking a political stance also by not saying anything. You might think it's too political to stand on the one side, but you're also taking a political stance by staying on the other. So or what people would call political. So either way you do it, you're you're getting that statement, I would tell you. And you're by making this statement, you're saying you want to welcome people. And if your church can't get to that, I struggle to understand why you're doing what you're doing as church. Um, doing, you might lose people in this process, but you're also going to gain people. Doing, it's what people do you want to have in your church? That, that And I know that can be a hard question to ask, and I struggle daily with how do I preach in ways and proclaim the gospel in ways that people can hear it, but also move them along to get closer to what this whole kingdom of God is supposed to look like and be like. Um, and there's an art and there's a difficulty to that, but at some point you just have to say, this is the gospel and this is what's right and this is what we're going to stand for. Um, and again, you might lose people in that process but you're going to gain other people in other ways. And I think to, to continue with what you're saying, Pastor Joey, I mean, our goal is to not operate out of fear. And so when we recognize what we are afraid of, um, you know, we can, I think it's important to name that, but then also name, you know, um, if people are going to leave because you begin to, you know, be RIC, um, then, then it's not a welcoming place and all are welcome also is not appropriate as a designation for the congregation. Um, and like Pastor Joey said, if, if we make decisions so people don't leave, we're also then making decisions so people won't come and hear the gospel. Um, so... I mean, if, if people were going to leave because we were feeding people, we would say, well, sorry, like we're, we are called to, to love in this capacity. Um, and so I think it, there are certain sensitive, um, you know, uh, topics in LGBTQ and racism and, um, the border, there's ones that are very hot topics, but, um, when we boil it down to, to welcome hospitality and love. it leads to difficult conversations that need to be had. Uh, I've developed a pretty big thing about, uh, as Christians, we, we need to prioritize the, I, I said it earlier, the, the personhood uh, of an individual over um, po political partisan policies. Uh, and, and if we, if we can't, see the person uh, and instead if we look at a person and say you're a political problem um, 
I don't think the church yet understands how threatening that actually is to that person. Uh, because we have especially seen in modern times what people do when they look at another group of people and they say, you're a political problem to us. I also, um, so my Synod of Origin is Virginia Synod, which when 2009 happened, fell very squarely on the fence around bound conscience, which is the theological statement that was used in the uh, 2009 human sexuality statement on why we can and why some Pastor congregations may not. Um, Pastor Brian, can you, yeah. can you break down what the what that is, the 2009 decision to give people more context before you go into your the rest of your story. Yeah, so LGBT inclusion in the ELCA dates all the way back into the AIDS epidemic of the 80s in terms of either the Lutheran Church trying to advocate for uh, participation of um, gay people in rostered ministry, so becoming pastors or deacons or associates in ministry in the church. Uh, there have been parts, especially in Philadelphia, New York, and San Francisco, where um, gay pastors have been serving in Lutheran congregations for quite some time. But in the 90s, particularly the late 90s, the church appointed a commission to, the national church appointed a discussion around it, which led to the 2009 social statement on human sexuality and looked at all aspects of human sexuality, which led to um, the decisions that were made at that churchwide assembly in 2009, which basically allowed congregations, if they chose, to call a partnered, um, uh, an individual in a publicly accountable, long-term monogamous, same gendered relationship um, or married. Um, or however they chose to identify that in a uh, way, because we couldn't even agree on the term marriage, right? In 2009, we were like, we can't call it marriage because marriage is only man and woman. And um, so much has happened since then, right? I mean, the Defense of Marriage Act has been repealed. Don't, don't ask, don't tell, isn't in the military anymore. Like the world has spun so far forward um, that we're actually beginning to have conversations about, do we amend the language that's even in that, in our documents to say, do we still need to call it this separate, but maybe equal term of same, a publicly accountable, long-term monogamous, same gendered relationship? Um, so those were all things that were kind of happening as part of a longer process for congregations to engage in that conversation from the late 90s until 2009. Well, many of our congregations didn't do that. And so they were kind of catching up to things. And then 2009 happened and, oh, the church split in a schism. And it was. I mean, it was like, Noah, do you remember? The, it was like 52 to 48 percent in terms of voting um, on the social statement. Um, and um, Sorry, I'll get really emotional about this. Um, I remember Bishop Hansen saying, we will hold this vote in the silence because we recognize that we are not united on this. And there will be people who will mourn and there will be people that celebrate. But as a whole, we will hold this vote of this thing that we did. Um, so I fully recognize that like our church is not of the same accord. Um, I take for granted the fact that we're in Philadelphia and it's a largely pretty progressive of the ELCA uh, synods. But when we go across the nation, we are not all like SIPA. We kind of exist as an anomaly in some respects. But um, growing up in you, we had people on both sides of this saying that we're not going to have a gay pastor and we're some congregations who were ready to have that. And so I think the genius of the, the, the decisions that were made in 2009 was that it did leave it to the congregation to decide. Um, but as I started interviewing in congregations for calls in the Virginia Synod, my bishop at the time said, no, 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 we have to have two votes. The congregation has to vote first whether they want a gay pastor and then second, to vote whether they want to call you. Which I was kind of like, okay, but none of my other 
colleagues are having two votes. So like, I get where you're coming from, but this isn't normalized and, and fair. Um, and so what really needs to happen is you, Bishop, need to push these congregations to have ongoing conversations about this. And I think there is some wisdom in saying these are ongoing conversations because when we allow congregations to take a vote, it draws a line in the sand and they can say we're done, especially in congregations where we don't think that full inclusion or affirmation is possible. Um, and so to kind of just continue to check the temperature within the community, I mean, like I said, look, at how far we've come in 10 years i mean holy cow um so you know i i serve in a synod with uh, i don't know 15 other lgbtqia plus um pastors there are some synods that have one or two so i forget that like we are who we are um and that's not always the case all over the place so <clears throat> Respecting either side of of where people are, it's something I had to learn to do, to just love them where they are. For Virginia, it was a biblical issue. It wasn't a political issue, um, which is another big pushing thing that we recognized in 2009 as a church. We had done a really bad job of teaching people about Bible. And I still think we do there's disconnect between what's happening in our seminaries and our universities in terms of, of learning and study and where we're bringing the people in the pews along. So when we begin to have these conversations, I recognize that there's a big gap. Um, so for example, one of the things I did in my congregation was not, um, we didn't really have the Bible study about exploring the social statement um, so that they would be on board with it because most of them already were. Um, but they wanted to know, how do I talk to my friend who says the Bible said this and that's it? And so they wanted to know from our Lutheran perspective, how do we encounter those texts? And I said, oh, we can do that because that's equipping them to talk and witness out in the world with their friends who don't understand why our church accepts, but their church discriminates. Um, so that's another big piece of helping people kind of navigate um, conversations around those. Sorry, that was a really, really long lesson of history of Lutherans being silly Lutherans. But I think it was really important. So, so thank you, Pastor Brian. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Brian. Um, Pastor Brian kept referring to, um, well, we cleared up the 2009 vote, but also the social statement, the social statement. And that is available online. Um, I just put it in the chat. It's um, the ELCA, the denomination statement on human sexuality. Um, and I believe that was last revised in um, 2009. Um, so it's kind of in all of that aftermath this is where the church kind of landed as a social statement so if you are ever curious about what the lutheran what the elca really has to say about human sexuality um it's for free download at that link um pastor brian also kind of mentioned um and, and we we're talking about welcome um, but we're also talking about affirmation and then of course the bible is starting to creep up um, I just want to say, um, I don't, I don't want to go into the weeds of the Bible. We could spend all night hashing out what the Bible really says. Um, if someone else has a condensed explanation of what are called the clobber verses, I, I, on the panel, I welcome that. Um, but if you want to speak in general terms to them, or if there's one you just really want to speak to, feel free. But um, I'm wondering if if any of you want to want to talk about that, what what the Bible really says, um, and also then getting to this point of and because I think they kind of go together. Um, what is what is affirmation, and and why is that important? Maybe over um, or instead of welcome. And while you all discuss that. There are some really helpful YouTube videos that are very accessible about what the Bible really says. So I will drop those in the chat with cartoons and everything. Your kids could watch them. Um, 
So yeah, feel free, Bible and affirmation. Uh, the, the Bible really doesn't say anything about what we call LGBTQ plus people and their relationships, except that they ought to love one another. I second that. Dr. Noah. Well, then, Dr. Noah, how come... <laughs> um, how come the Bible says this and how come right. the Bible says that and the Bible says a lot of things I should and shouldn't do? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Um, it does. And, and yet uh, there's this guy named Jesus who the church affirms to be God among us, who teaches us how to read the Bible. Uh, and he is asked, what are the greatest command or what is the greatest commandment? And he said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, he's saying, if you want to understand what the Bible is trying to say, you filter it through this lens of love. Uh, and that's how you will understand what, what the Bible is trying to say. So if you cannot uh, understand a passage and how it compels a person to love God or the neighbor, uh, we either do not have the passage in its complete context, either uh, uh, within the narrative of the Bible itself or within its uh, social or historical context. Um, because that's what God among us said would be the best way to understand scripture. So uh, some of the problems that we encounter would be, uh, there's uh, passages, uh, I think it's in, it's either first or second Corinthians. I, I, don't, I don't remember which one right now, but, uh, uh, it, it uses the word, I, th I think even the NRSV uses the word homosexual in it. Um, that word doesn't exist for the Greek speaking community. Uh, it, what, what words are there is malakoi and arsenikoi. Um, we don't know what they mean because Paul's the only person who uses those terms. And, uh, and while you can break them down to say like arsenikoi means uh, beds men, uh, just because you have a, a compound word like that, that doesn't tell you the exact meaning of the word. Uh, and an example of that is butterfly or hot dog. Um, neither of those words, if you just look at them as they are, tell you what that word is actually referring to. Uh, there's no butter involved with butterflies. Um, and there might be a question of whether or not that happens in Greek. The answer is yes. The word cyclops or cyclopsis in Greek it just means round eye. There's nothing about that term that tells you that that creature has one eye. Uh, the literal word just means round eye. So we get these translations, most of them relatively modern, that then use these more modern terms uh, because they just decided that's what it meant. Uh, and, and that's a problem if, if we then take that as the word of God uh, and, and for me, and my part of my whole coming out story was uh, wrestling with that question about how, how does this stance communicate love of God or neighbor? It just seems very arbitrary. Um, so I can keep going on being both now uh, having a doctorate and a pastor, uh, despite the fact that I'm an introvert, I can ramble forever. So uh, I think I'll just stop there and, and, and just leave those as examples of, uh, of how I think that these texts have been uh, misused to talk about a phenomena that the, the ancients just would not have understood. One text that I think about um, that not necessarily, some people could say is, is one of those quote unquote clobber texts, but um, 
is the creation story where, you know, it says God created male and female. God created them in their image, right? And so one for me, but that's also a passage that affirms my identity as someone who is bi or part of the LGBT community. In, cre in this creation story, right, we hear that God created night, day, that God created land and sea, right? But we know there's way much more than that. There's marshes, there's one of my favorite times, you know, there's dusk, dawn, there's so many parts that are not specifically in that this or that. That's one of the reasons also why I love being a Lutheran and I talk about this, you know, I'm a both and person. Um, you know, we talked about at the very beginning, you know, loving the sin or loving the sinner, but hating the sin, right? And, and so, but like, really we're both and. We, we are all sinners and we are also saints because Luther says we are forgiven sinners, right? So that goes back to the, that's all of us. And I, that was one of the first places that I found kind of that text for me um, was in, was in one of the books um, called Transforming the Bible and the Lives of Transgender Christians by Austin Hark. And also I wanted just to say that I have lots of resources and I will be putting all of the resources that have been mentioned and all of the resources of videos and other things that have been mentioned in our call tonight and just putting them all together so that if you're like, wait, I need this and I missed that, we'll put them all together. So hopefully you'll be able to see those. So. Uh, I wanted to tag in on uh, Pastor Daniel's question there and the uh in the chat about other affirming texts, uh, because um, there's one that I'm known for that I have yet to really explain that that uh, got splashed across Queer Eye, and that was the uh, the healing of the centurion slave and and the question about the relationship between the two. Uh, and so, what I want to do is is back up with that and and say, you know, I grew up fundamentalist. A lot of my friends are. Uh, from high school, we're still fundamentalists. Um, and uh, I went to one of their weddings. And, and of course, obviously, this is a, a man and a woman getting married because fundamentalists don't do any other kinds of marriage uh, or marriage for any other kinds of people. And, uh, and yet, at their wedding, they read the story of Ruth and Naomi uh, and, and applied that to this heterosexual couple and what strikes me is that for so long, the church has allowed straight people to see their relationship reflected in whether or not they're sexual in, in these non-gender uh, complementary relationships. And, and so while there's no way to know in a scientific way what the relationship was between, say, the centurion and, uh, uh, and his slave uh, that Jesus then heals, I think the problem fundamentally is that, that the church has prevented the uh, LGBTQ plus community from seeing their lives reflected in the biblical narrative in the same way that they have permitted uh, straight couples with, for example, Ruth and Naomi uh, to see their relationship reflected in people. So uh, for me, that's what it means to, uh, to do queer theology with scripture is not to adamantly say, oh, we've got to go find uh, gay people in the Bible but but to to um we have these other practices which have been affirming for other people uh, and and then the question is why why not why not allow them to be affirming for uh, queer communities also so um i i more specifically uh, daniel to your specific question about 
about text. I mean, there, there are other places in the Bible where the Bible tries to teach us how, how to read it. Um, by Thor, my apologies, but, um, uh, but the, the two that come to mind is uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, um, where Paul talks about uh, how our ancestors, and he's writing to a primarily Gentile community, how our ancestors uh, passed through the Red Sea and were baptized into Moses. Um, you know, and so Paul is inviting a kind of typological reading there uh, that I think permits the, the kinds of readings of seeing straight couples in Ruth and Naomi and uh, queer couples in Ruth and Naomi as well. Um, that, that that's a, a typological reading that, that opens that sort of thing up. Um, and then I think a big one is the, um, in, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, you know, you search the scriptures for salvation, and yet it, they point to me. Uh, and that, I think Lutherans ought to be, like, really grasping onto, because that's our whole thing, is that scripture points to Christ. Uh, and there we have Jesus saying it uh, in the text itself. So hopefully that, that, that adds a little more for you. I'll also add in um, for you are fearfully and wonderfully made is is also my go to text, especially for youth um, of, of, of all the spectrums. Right. So like oftentimes youth are really wrestling with what it means to be who they are and they're trying to discern what gifts God has given them um, and to remind them that, that, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made um, exactly as they are and not what the world thinks that they should be. Um, the other one that I, I, for me, is always the Ethiopian eunuch, right? I mean, here's someone of, of other gendered origin, other ethnic origin, um, and is one of the ones with the eyes for uh, the church to see that, yes, baptism is for all. So um, that's another good one that I usually go to in terms of affirming this kind of work. Um, and we also have the like disciple whom Jesus loved. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. Wait around in that, in discernment story, and and what does that mean? Um, so yeah. I know for me, when I was in Old Testament class in seminary, I had never encountered the story of um, David and Jonathan, or any of that, and. I should have. I feel like that's it's a pretty big part of David's origin story that was really never mentioned in the lectionary that much, never was really brought up and growing up in church. And I get to Old Testament, I read this, I'm like, this is gay. Like, this feels gay. Whether or not it is gay, we can't really know. But I mean, he is wrecked. He talks about, I think, being of my own heart. Like, this feels gay to me. And it was the first time I'd ever, like Noah said, kind of projected some of my own feelings onto a character. I'm like, oh my goodness, there's someone like me in here. And I didn't even know we could do that. Um, and my professor at the time, when I brought up, like, this feels a bit homosexual, went, oh no. Um, but he was a visiting professor, not one who was with LTSP. And I think there were other things going on there. Um, but either way, I do agree with Noah that we haven't been always given permission to project ourselves into the scripture like others have been. Um, one of the resources that I wanted to mention real quick that really helped us, um, when I was in college at Teal College, I helped found the first Pride Week that they started doing at Teal College, and they still do it now, so that's exciting. Um, but we showed a movie every year. It's a probably a little dated now, but it does go through all the different tech clobber passages it also goes through a few different stories and different denominations of how they're dealing with um, the LGBT issue. And it's called For the Bible Tells Me So. Um, it's, I think, like an hour and a half long, but it is a very good documentary that deals with a lot of the clobber passages. It talks about um, Bishop Gene Robinson, who was the first gay bishop to be or um, ordained. No, what do they call it in the Episcopal Church? Either way, he's the first gay bishop in the Episcopal Church. So it tells his story about how he'd wear Kevlar best to his... Um, Consecration. That's where they use consecration, doing that kind of thing. So I would recommend that movie to anyone who's looking for it. 
Uh, and real quick to get to Vicar Kayla's second half, the question about welcoming versus affirming. Um, welcoming is I'm allowed in the door and that's great. Affirming to me is when you actually see my gifts and see that I can bring something to this place and you encourage me to use them. Um, Dan, and I think the RIC process, I've never led someone through it, but does a decent job of saying, Dan, yes, you're adopting a welcoming statement, but it doesn't stop there. You don't just end there. Affirming is doing the work of then, once these people come in the door saying, yes, we're happy you're here. Yes, we want you to get involved. Yes, we see you have gifts and that you will transform us and you will call us to different places and you will listen to our voices. Um, Dan, that we won't try and keep you down or push you out. Dan, we don't need to comment again on what you said, we'll just let you speak for yourself. Then that is affirming to me. Um, I mean, even earlier a bit in the conversation today, and I don't mean to pick on you, but like Pastor Bill came in and doing talked for a while, about six minutes, and I mean, he wasn't the focus of the conversation, but suddenly he was re-commenting on basically everything we had already said. I mean, affirming is listening to us when we said it and not needing to necessarily state it back to us again. Um, I mean, that, that's a reality. I think affirming also is um, just being mindful of how many, like, what is your language? So when we baptized our son, I had to write my name under mother. Now, granted, none of us are going to go and buy new books, but like, what do your baptismal forms say? What do your registration forms say for, you know, permission slips for, for youth ministry things or emergency contacts? It's very easy to just say parent one and parent two. We also ran into this even with our own colonial school district. We could not register our son for kindergarten without first killing off his biological mother because their system had no way to handle a registration with two dads. So thankfully one of my members is on the school board and it's been fixed in less than three weeks, but like, it's still a thing that like, you know, that doesn't make my family feel really welcome um, in, in being part of the school system, especially for your first year. Um, it's also good to think about, you know, what images and stories do you tell as a congregation? Um, preachers should definitely be mindful of, do you preach examples of uh, same-sex couples? Do you preach about kids um, being able to be accepted as they are wrestling with who and what they are? Um, and creating a culture of, of welcome and um, affirmation for loving anybody uh, where they are and not where we think they should be. Because that's another big danger sometimes with, uh, I think, affirmation is we function very much in this post-enlightenment world with um, wanting to classify things and put them in their genus order species phylum kingdom order that LGBTQIA plus sometimes becomes another box and really we're, we're trying to to get away from the boxiness of it um, and, and really embrace the fullness of the spectrum so the one part of my class for youth ministry LGBT issues um, and, and I stole this, I'm sorry, I didn't steal it. I cleverly borrowed it from the Trevor Project, which is another great organization out there. But it, but it's the emphasis that labels are there for the individual to use to define themselves. It is not for you as the other to use on them. Um, and so that's kind of a big piece, I think, that goes along with affirmation and welcome, that it's, it's not something that we are using to label them. It is something that we are comfortable using language of so that when someone identifies themselves as they or them, we know how to, to, to use language to, to show that they are welcome. I, 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 yeah, I think the affirming part really gets back to what Pastor Joey was saying at the beginning about uh, not just the, the wild, crazy statement that says you're, you're welcome here, but then what happens after that, the, the kind of long, uh, uh, the, the long process of, of integration and uh, non-othering into the community. 
uh, and, and labels certainly gets in the way of that when they're not used in healthy ways. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that we're not striving for diversity. Um, diversity is just having all the different, you know, different people in a room, um, you know, welcome to, to join the party. Um, you know, inclusion, okay, they can have a seat at the table. Um, that's, that's nice. Um, you know, equity, include, they can be part of the conversation. Um, but then affirming to me is valuing their input um, as legitimate. Um, and by there, I just mean whoever, um, you know, we want to be affirming of, of the whole. And I think um, also, you know, it can be, you know, inviting um, to sit on council to be in, you know, in, engaged and involved. But I think also um, being willing to talk about, you know, spouses, partners, um, children, to not have it just be sort of the elephant in the room that's not spoken about, um, but fully engaging with. Um, wanting to learn about um, whomever in, in their life um, just as much as you would ask, you know, oh, did, you know, you and your husband go on vacation? Um, you know, it's taken a people a while to, to refer to Meg as my wife. You know, it's, it's always sort of, sometimes I think it's, um, you know, perceived as my roommate, you know, but then we move into like spousal language and it's like, oh, okay, good, good. Uh, we're changing the, you know, the understanding here. I think also going off what Pastor Jen said of <clears throat> that affirming of listening to the language that people use for themselves, um, either whether it's their pronouns or other things. Um, like for me personally, I use spouse or partner um, to talk about that person to, to his name is David, um, versus, you know, husband or other things. And so I need to, for, you know, I need to get better at saying actually, you know, like spouse, but, um, or partner and correcting someone. And so just kind of even just affirming someone is just listening to the words that they're using to talk about themselves. And I think that can be in many different ways. Uh, that's just a kind of way to affirm someone. Um, I think this is a good time to also fold in how, um, like, what can we do for kids? Pastor Brian, you started to, to touch on this, but there was a question put in the chat to everyone that I want to make sure it doesn't get overlooked. What can the church community do to help nurture this kind of all-encompassing love with um, with kids in Sunday school or youth group? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just point out, like, it, it's not anything different than what it means to do great youth ministry. And it's about helping create relationships with younger folks and help them have their understand a connection to a Jesus who loves them exactly as they are. Um, and so one of the things that we've learned from folks who have researched, you know, my generation is that um, for faith to catch in the life of a young person, they need to be surrounded by um, three triple A adults. And so a, a, an adult who is available, authentic and affirming um, that kids who are surrounded with three adults in their faith communities that represented those three characteristics were likely to have faith passed on to them um, in more effective they were active in a faith community as adults um, when they, they had those kind of presences in their life. So I think helping um, create those relationships in your congregation with youth is really important. Um, also a small shout out for um, uh, Ross's new book, Deacon Ross Murray, um, just came out with a book, Made, Known, and Unloved. Um, full confession, it came 
here last month and I haven't had a chance to read it yet other than skim it and just say that this is a pretty good systematic presentation of all the things we have been saying in youth ministry circles for a long time. Um, Ross has been instrumental in Wonderfully Made Camp in, Noah, where is it, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota? Uh, the Naming Project. Uh, the Naming Project, sorry. Yeah. The Naming Project in Minnesota, yep. Yeah, um, and so he's been journeying with young people for the better part of the last decade um, and learning as you go. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget my first wonderfully made camp um, that we did with our synod. Uh, Fred Martin Wolf and I were the adult leaders and we had some of the youth leaders from the Attic Youth Center in Philadelphia. And that was the first time that I had ever been introduced to pronouns and all the kids sat there in the circle the first time doing the introductions and just zipped through all their pronouns as we went around. And I was like, what? Um, and it felt really, really weird at first, but now like it's just kind of a normal thing that just people do. Um, and so even for me as a member of the community, there are things that I have learned to do that help uh, affirm and welcome people into creating that kind of safe space. So that's like another thing that you can practice by just saying, you know, hey, when we do name introductions, this is how we do that. And this is why we do that. Um, so that if somebody did, um, uh, transitions in your youth program, it's something that the kids all as a whole have the capacity to hold together um, for things. Um, I've also got a bunch of resources for from the Trevor Project about helping kids navigate coming out, because that's also sometimes not always the safest thing to handle. And so you as the leader in youth and congregations need to be mindful that helping a youth navigate just because you're safe in your youth group or your congregation does not mean it is safe in their family their school or their other communities. And so to help them kind of navigate um, knowing where it's okay to be safe with that information is, is also really helpful. And the Trevor Project has a whole like little journal book that helps them recognize who are the allies at school, who are the allies at church, who are the allies in my family, um, so that they know the safe people to be able to be in conversation with because um, it, it is still true that one of the highest homeless rates for youth right now is among the LGBT community. Um, and that's because there's an awful lot of families out there that don't don't tolerate it. So um, be mindful of that. Um, we say we love you as you are, you're perfectly fine to be who you are, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are safe to be who they are given their living situation as a minor in America right now. So um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. And also just like also helping people understand scripture the way like we've been talking about here. So making sure that those stories at age appropriate levels are talked about. Um, I'm also a big proponent or, or, or a big um, advocate for uh, faith-based sexual education. Um, often we leave that as a dirty little thing for the public schools to handle and we teach them nothing about um, understanding sex from a faith perspective. And there are wonderful ways to do that in age appropriate ways um, that help um, us have that conversation faithfully. Um, the uh, UCC church is um, great with resources for that. There's Our Whole Lives program, um, which is part of the Religious Institute, I think. I think that's where I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, but they have great age appropriate um, curriculum to help kind of talk about sexuality and in, in both sex positive ways, but then also in um, uh, an acknowledgement of the gender identity, sexual orientation, gender presentation spectrums. So um, how to help people have those conversations. I, I posted one other resource uh, in uh, Beloved Arise, uh, belovedarise.org is uh, somebody that I've connected with and have done a couple of things online. They're mostly, I think, an online ministry, uh, but they do have resources. They're pretty active, especially on Instagram. And, uh, and they are uh, supporting pri primarily um, uh, queer youth of, uh, of faith, 
uh, mostly Christian, but they do have resources that extend even beyond uh, the Christian circle. But their their focus is primarily uh, they identify as a Christian ministry, I should say. It's also helpful to start thinking through the logistics of not if we have a youth who comes out, but when we have a youth who comes yeah. out, um, because here's what you don't want to do. And Lord knows I've been in the youth ministry world long enough. It, this is the way it always plays out, right? You're scrambling to get out the door to go to the retreat. And then suddenly you realize, oh, is Tim going to sleep with the rest of the guys? Or do we need to create some other situation and living <laughs> sleeping arrangements? Um, and so to talk about how you as a congregation on overnight trips or things like that would handle um, uh, youth who have identified as uh, gay or lesbian, but also in a growing number of cases, also what happens when a youth decides to transition and how, how you will handle the boundaries of gender identity to um, a youth who may be transitioning. And, and I, I, I know Ross has dealt with that, the, uh, because that was one of the most frequent questions he gets. I think it's in the book. I don't okay. remember I about, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you handle sleeping arrangements? And uh, short answer, because I've been uh, uh, to that camp, uh, they just all sleep in the same room. Everybody's together uh, along with the chaperones. So one thing speaking from my experience when I was a youth um, and something never try to force any youth out of the closet you may make assumptions you may know and you may be right about that but do not necessarily push them out until they are ready and one of the greatest tools that helped me get to a place to coming out was in my confirmation class my pastor had a box you could ask anonymous questions whenever you wanted by the next class, he would answer all the questions that were put in the box. And our youth actually used the box. And I was able to ask questions about the church and sexuality in that box without him knowing who I was, without him doing, making assumptions. And I don't know if he ever did, but it gave me the anonymity to explore what I needed to explore in the church without outing myself by being the one asking all these questions about, does the church allow gay pastors or something? Do you know I mean? So having a way to talk about these issues in an anonymous way helped me immensely. Um, and I'm sure it helped educate the kids around me too, doing the question was asked in a public way. Um, but I think it's important to res not respect the closet that comes out the wrong way, but understand people will come out on their own times and offering them a way to explore without outing themselves is very important. So um, I'm aware of the time and um, Pastor Marie, I think we said we're just going to do kind of a resource compilation and we'll send that out. Is that? Yeah, that's what I think um, that was kind of, I was, I was thinking that, and especially since we're recording this today, we can include the recording, this video. So if you're, if you were like, wait, I missed something that was said, you know, you can go back and, and look at this. Um, and so, and also this will go for any of the other people who are on this panel. Um, if you all have any other resources that you think about in the next couple of days, um, shoot me a message, um, you know, and that goes for any of you all here. If you have any questions, you know, um, my email is out there, I believe, um, but I can, well, and then if you're willing, the, the people who are also on the panel, um, I can include your email as well to on the resource list. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, I just put, I think we never did put reconciling works in the chat. So yeah. I put it there. Yeah. that is the best place to, to start. If you're doing baby steps, that is, that's your go-to spot to start um, in the ELCA. Um, thank you all so much to our panelists. Are there any burning statements you need to make that you have to get off your chest tonight uh, anything else you want us to know all right thank you uh so much for sharing uh, a very personal part of yourselves and yet all of yourself in a way um, and thank you for sharing your witness and for doing the work that you do um, yeah, we will send out resources and contact information 
Uh, thank you all for attending and for having the curiosity um, and the willingness to learn and continue to grow in faith. Um, we, our church is certainly better for it. Um, I was going to close us in prayer and we keep uh, tossing around the UCC, the um, United Church of Christ. They seem to be a few steps ahead of us. And so um, I wanted to share this um, prayer with, with all of you tonight. Um, so the Lord be with you. Holy God of blessing, eternally we co-create ourselves in your love. All companionship orientations, all gender identities and expressions, all ways of having family. We celebrate LGBTQIA plus peoples everywhere, knowing that many are still not safe to come out, to be free, or to live life abundantly. Heal all who are ill in body, mind, heart, or spirit. Bind up all wounds and provide adequate care. Extinguish any stigma people are enduring. We celebrate because everyone should be celebrated. We are your body on earth, this body of Christ. May all of our love and hope be sent on the wings of this prayer to all who need refreshing, affirmation, and love's embrace. Amen. Uh, thank you all, and please be in touch if anything else comes up. Any other questions? Have and you thank you, Vicar Kayla, for moderating, and Pastor Marie for pulling this all together. We very much appreciate your work and bringing yeah. this to fruition. So thank you. Yes, and thank you all for showing up and being a part of the panel and for coming tonight. So. And as a reminder, yes, this is recording. So Kayla, if you want to stop the recording and then if anybody, I'm gonna stay on for a little bit.